True forgiveness doesn't repeat the matter and bring it up in their face again. Instead, a forgiving heart turns into a loving heart. And that loving action takes the place of resentment and revenge. Jesus said, love your enemies. He didn't say, wait until they love you. Love your enemies, do good to them, pray for them, bless them. I want to close with the request that Joseph gave to his brothers. You don't have to turn there, I'll just read it to you. This was after he revealed himself to them, okay? He, he had been horribly mistreated by his brothers. They wanted to kill him. In fact, most of them were going to kill him and throw him into a cistern, okay? It was Reuben that saved his life, basically. So they ended up taking him out of the cistern after they threw him in there and selling him to the Ishmaelite caravan, which went down into Egypt. So, I mean, Joseph could have, hold, could have held grudges for many years against his brothers. But what happened? What happened here? In Genesis 45, verse 4, he said to his brothers, after he revealed himself to them, come near to me. Come close to me. You see, Joseph had completely forgiven them in his heart. But you know something? That's not the end of it. That's not a full-orbed, we might say, forgiveness. What's also involved? In Genesis chapter 50, verse 21, Joseph told his brothers, Don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. He reassured them and spoke kindly to them. And he cared for them. So what's that tell us? Complete biblical forgiveness is comprised of two basic elements. First of all, a total canceling or erasing of those offenses in your heart. You part, in other words, you pardon the person in your heart. You'll never bring it up in their face again. That's the first step. Secondly, you take definite steps to reestablish or establish a new biblical relationship between you and the one who offended you. True repentance will bear fruit in harmony with it. In other words, there's, there's going to be a change in that person who forgives that, that offender. That's exactly what Joseph did with his brothers. He provided for them till his death. It's exactly what that Korean father did with his son's killer. He brought him into his home and eventually led him to Christ. And the same man who in cold blood shot down his son in front of his eyes became a shepherd to God's people. It's what Johan did to the Muslims by going out and evangelizing them to Christ. What's that tell us? A forgiving heart leads to loving actions. Now, they may not accept those loving actions. That doesn't matter. We need to do our part and love them. God's heart of forgiveness moved himself to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. Before you can ever receive God's forgiveness and pardon and release from your sin, you must believe that you offended God's holy character when you broke his law. God has pronounced you a sinner. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, God has pronounced you a sinner. You are guilty before God. You are deserving of eternal punishment and separation from him in the fires of hell. Did you know that? Romans 3.23 states in the Greek text, For all sin when Adam sinned. We were in Adam. When Adam sinned, we sinned. And then it says all are continually and daily falling short of the absolute perfection and glory of God. I don't think there's any verse that paints a better picture of our condition before God 
every day we are falling short of the perfection of God. It doesn't matter what I think about it. It doesn't matter what you think about it. It's what God thinks about your soul and mine that matters. And he declares us a sinner. And he says if we haven't trusted him as our Savior, that we are separated from him right now. But the great news is that God sent his son to die on the cross, not to condemn you, but to save you, to forgive you of all your sin, to cancel the entire record of transgression against him. And that's why it's impossible, impossible for you to save yourself. You'd have to be perfect like God. And that's unthinkable. Just as God rejected Cain's sacrifice of his own human works, whose sacrifice did he accept? Abel's, the blood sacrifice. So God still rejects all human works for salvation. He says, God says in Isaiah 64, 6, all our righteousnesses, human good, human works, are as filthy, and that word in the Hebrew means menstrual. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in God's sight. So what's he put over that verse? Unacceptable. Human good, unacceptable. Human works, unacceptable. I want you to think about an illustration today. You have a ladder, okay? A ladder and an elevator. The ladder stands up, but it doesn't reach heaven. But people are constantly, every day, trying to climb that ladder through their own ability and so forth, okay? Some get a couple runs up. They're the worst of sinners. It's just as far as they get. Some are midway. Some even get way to the top. But the ladder doesn't reach into heaven. It never will. So that you can go as high as you want, morally speaking, by human works, you'll always fall short. Then you have an elevator, and that goes all the way into heaven. What must you do to get into heaven? God says, repent. Obey his gospel. Hop on the elevator, so to speak. And you aren't going to get into heaven on your own power. You're going to get into heaven by God's power. He's going to bring you into heaven when you trust in his son to save you. Peter declared, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a command from God. I said this before. It's not an option. It's a command. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And that's God's promise to you. So when you trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you, God's forgiveness of your eternal debt to him kicks in. He's already made it all possible. And the Bible says in a variety of ways that you're forgiven. How does God say it? He takes away all your sin. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. They will never be found. Jeremiah 50 verse 20. He cleanses your heart as white as snow. Isaiah 1 18. He pardons you eternally. He casts them into the depths of the sea. Micah. 719. He remembers them no more. Hebrews 10, 17. He casts them behind his back. Isaiah 38, 17. He blots them out completely. Isaiah 43, 25. He cancels the entire record of wrongs against him. Colossians 2, 14. Will you believe it? Will you believe it today? God has done this for you. If you will trust in him to save you. My friend, the Bible says that if you're still here today without Jesus Christ, you are still in a state of being guilty before God. You're traveling on the road to destruction 
I don't care how much religion you got behind you. How many times you've come to church. It doesn't matter. It does no good, for one thing, to try to drown your guilt in alcohol or drugs. That won't remove the guilt. And God will not somehow feel sorry for you and let you in. It does no good to deny your guilt. We'll all stand before our Creator someday, and we're going to be judged, not on man's standard, but on God's standard of right and wrong. It does no good to deflect your guilt on other people, blaming them for all your problems. The guilt of others cannot wash away your own guilt. It can't wash away your own stains. The truth is this. It boils down to this. Our guilt before God can only be dissolved in the blood of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He'll remove all your sin when you trust in him. The hymn writer penned, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So don't think that, you know, your good will somehow outweigh your bad and God will let you in. It doesn't work that way. Man wants it to work that way, but that's not the way God looks at it. And you can take every recovery program this world can offer, and you can clean up your outward life. But if you don't trust in Jesus Christ alone to save you, you'll find yourself in the lake of fire if you die. Because you haven't been cleansed inside. Your conscience hasn't been cleansed before God. You are not free. You are not pardoned. It's as simple as that. The writer of Hebrews asked, How shall we escape judgment if we ignore such a great salvation? If we ignore such a great Savior? Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 that the Lord Jesus Christ, when he comes again, will punish those who do not know God and did not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You see, it comes down to a choice of obedience or a choice of disobedience. And no one can make the choice for you. Everyone everywhere is responsible to obey the Lord of this universe. We aren't just dealing with another prophet. We're dealing with God, our creator. What's God's final invitation? Turn to me and be saved, all the peoples of the earth, for I am God, and there is no other. There is no other God. There is no other Savior. I want to talk in closing just to my brothers and sisters in Christ. You know something? If you don't forgive a person in your heart, it's going to... It's never going to go away. It's going to affect your walk with God every single day. If you're here and you're a Christian and you haven't forgiven that person or persons in the past who abused you or misused you in some way, sinned against you, offended you, I want you to take four steps. Take four steps. Very simple. First of all, Write a detailed explanation of how this person wronged you. And also put down how it made you feel. If it's a series of offenses or grievances, put them down one by one. You might have several pages. You might have a little book. Secondly, and do this when you're alone, read it aloud. You not only see it on paper, but you hear it with all your tones of anger and rage. Thirdly, bow your head and pray, forgive me, God. What I've written here is sin against you. 
You've commanded me to forgive anyone who has sinned against me. You've commanded me to love my enemies, but instead I've harbored this anger and bitterness and resentment against them all these years. As a result, it's had that rippling effect. I've had an unloving spirit, a critical attitude toward the people around me. And then the final step is this. Take your list of grievances, go out in the backyard someplace or out in the woods, dig a hole, burn all the grievances, all the pages, burn them up so that all there is is ashes, and then pour that dirt over that, over those ashes. Bury them and never go back to them again. You can forgive, my brothers and sisters. And I I just sense that a lack of forgiveness in some of us is keeping us from going forward in the Christian life. Will you do that? And once you have forgiven in your heart, then you can show loving actions toward this person. Even if they don't accept your love, you can still be praying for them That's a big step in the right direction. Start praying for them. Let your heart be filled with the love of God. Who knows, maybe God will use you or use your prayers to turn that person around toward him once again. We cannot go on with an unforgiving spirit and claim that we love God. It's impossible. We deceive ourselves. God wants us to be free. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Niagara Frontier Bible Church, and hope you enjoyed today's sermon. But in closing, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? Well, before you answer that, let me share one final thing with you. The Bible says that God is holy and that we are not. The Bible says that all of us, including myself, have fallen short of the glory of God and that the wages of our sin is death. We don't deserve to go to heaven. We deserve to go to hell. And since we have a problem, we don't want to admit this. God, out of love, sent us something called the Ten Commandments, His law, to show us that there's no way in the world that we could ever make it to heaven on our own. Let's take a look at a couple of them. The Bible says that you shall not lie, ever, not once in your life. How many guys have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Well, for those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just proved my point. That would make you and I a liar before God. The Bible says you shall not steal. And if we're all honest with ourselves, we've taken something, even once, in our lives without permission. That makes us a thief. The Bible says you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. And now the Lord's name has become a cuss word. We've broken that. The Bible says that makes us a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. If you think you're going to get to heaven on your own, you shall never do that. But hey, you might think, well, that's a piece of cake. I've never done that one. Really? Jesus said, if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. One more. The Bible says you shall not murder. And you might say, hey, no problem that one. I've never done that. Really? Jesus said, if you hate somebody in your heart, it's the same as murder in his eyes. Folks, that's just five out of ten commandments. How are you doing? You're going to tell me that you're going to stand before God and you really think he's going to let you into heaven and he's going to ask you, hey, who are you? And you say, hey, God, let me in. By your own admission, I'm a lying, thief, blasphemer, adulterer, murderer. Let me in. Folks, God's not going to let you in. We don't deserve to go to heaven, folks. We have broken God's law. We deserve to die and go straight to hell. Here's the good news. God doesn't want you to go to hell. So He's pardoned you for your crimes. He wants to get you off a death row. And just like in real life, a person can't get off a death row if they receive the governor's pardon. But just like in real life, a governor could write the pardon, even though the person's guilty of their crimes. He could write the pardon and say, you don't have to go to the death penalty. But if they don't receive that pardon from the governor, they will still go to the death penalty. Folks, that's what God has done every day to everyone all over the world. Jesus Christ took the death penalty in our place. And every day that a person's alive, God is reaching out to them, asking them, pleading with them, please receive my pardon. 
for your crimes. Please don't go through with the death penalty. Hey, if you're here today and you want to make sure that you're going to heaven, you need to receive God's pardon for your crimes through Jesus Christ. If that's you today, then maybe you could pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I know that I've broken your law. I am a sinner. I agree that you are holy and that I am not. And I'll never make it to heaven on my own. Please forgive me, Jesus, of all my sins. I believe that you died for me on the cross and rose again from the grave to pay the price for all my sins. I turn from my sins today and I turn to you. I trust in you, Jesus, and in you alone to take me to heaven. Make me into the person you want me to be. I surrender this life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, if you really prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, I want to be the first one to congratulate you. Welcome to God's Forever Family. But that's just the beginning. When a person first gets saved, which is just what happened to you, the Bible likens you as a baby. And a baby needs food, they need nutrients, they need somebody to care. And that's why something important you need to do now is to find a good, healthy church in your area who can help provide that nourishment for you. Unfortunately, not all churches are very good churches, so if you have some questions, then please contact us, and we'd be glad to help you out. You need to get a Bible. You need to read the Word of God. And that's where you're going to find out about God and His wonderful plan and the reason and what He has planned and, and saved you for. You need to find it out in there as well. You need to pray to God. He's with you now wherever you go as His child. And prayer is not something mystical or magical. It's just simply having a conversation with God wherever you go. And finally, you need to tell somebody else about your new relationship with God and how that they can know for sure today how they can go to heaven instead of hell through God's pardon through Jesus Christ. Well, this has been Pastor Billy Crone of Niagara Frontier Bible Church. If there's anything we can do to help you, please don't hesitate to contact us. Our information, our contact information will be coming up on the screen here shortly, and we'd love to hear from you. Remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless. Thank you for watching this presentation from Niagara Frontier Bible Church. If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 5287 Bronson Drive, Lewiston, New York, 14092, or you can give us a call at 716-297-8783, or for email, office at niagarafrontierbible.com, or you can visit our website at www.niagarafrontierbible.com.